event. So I, I think the big question is why did we decide to host this webinar? Well, Edisyst has been talking about these population and labor trends over the last two years. And very recently, the conference board came out with uh, a new research study, um, not only about these trends, but the impact of them on the United States and the globe, plus the impact on business performance. And we think it is critical information for our clients, not only from a human resource perspective, but also from an education perspective. So with that, my name is Mark Ward, and I'm the VP and General Manager of EdAssist. We are the leader of tuition assistance management, and we help companies to align their tuition assistance spend with their overall corporate strategy. So we are for fortunate today to have Gad Lebanon join us from the, com the conference board. Now his official title is Director of Macroeconomic Research. That's a, that's a big title, where he also leads the labor market program. He also serves on the Demand Institute leadership team. Um, he doesn't just do research, but he's also an innovator. He developed the Conference Board Employment Index, Trend Index, which we will talk more about today. So his research focuses on trends in the U.S., the global markets, consumer trends, forecasting using economic indicators. Uh, Gad received his Ph.D. in economics from Princeton University, and he holds undergraduate and master's degrees from Tel Aviv University in Israel. So we're lucky to have Gad on the call today to discuss the most recent report titled From Not Enough Jobs to Not Enough Workers. So welcome, Gad. We're glad you're here. Uh, let me ask you this. Why did you decide to engage in this report? Thank you, Mark, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to participate in this presentation. Uh, so why did we um, decide to research this topic? Uh, I think it's um, probably one of the most important topics and main challenges uh, for uh, employers in the coming decade. Um, we, uh, as the baby boomers, the huge generation of baby boomers are retiring, I think we're likely to see uh, significant labor shortages in the coming decade in the U.S. and in many other uh, advanced economies. Well, that's great. Well, we're certainly excited about it. In fact, I, I was really fascinated by how these population labor trends will impact businesses in the coming years, and I know the report focuses on that, and we'll talk about that today. I guess one of the questions after you is, can you share with us some of the key findings from uh, from this recent report? Sure, and, and let me start with a little uh, background on, on um, how we got to that. So I think uh, the, the first um, trend that we looked at and, and caused us to be concerned is the very large uh, decline in the unemployment rate in the United States. And, and in May this year, we released a report about the looming labor shortages in the U.S. at the macro level. And then uh, we got very good feedback, and um, one of the feedback was uh, that it's good to know that labor shortages are coming at the, the macro level but it would be even more useful to learn in what types of jobs, in what occupations and industries we are likely to are likely to suffer more from labor shortages. So in the September report, we extended the research to include um, uh, other advanced economies, but I think the main contribution of the new report that was released uh, in September was to uh, dig deeper in the U.S. to uh, 464 occupations and 266 in industries, and for each of them to create a measure of labor shortages uh, risk uh, in the coming decade. Yeah, so that's that's great. That, I mean, the overall, we're going to get to that. We're actually going to talk about the specifics around those different uh, occupation areas. I'm wondering before we dig into all the details, if you wouldn't mind highlighting some of the some of the key overall macro oh, findings. Sure. So I think one um, at the big picture uh, level, one of the main uh, trends that we are seeing now in the global economy is that working age population in advanced economies is actually declining in recent years. In some countries it's up, in some countries it's down, but if you average across all advanced economies. Uh, you see a decline in working age population. And that plus sluggish economic growth that we're expecting um, is go going to put a significant pressure on, on corporate profits because the, this shrinkage in working age population is likely to cause tight labor markets. 
and a faster wage growth. So corporate profits are going to be squeezed first by low revenue growth and then by uh, increase in uh, labor costs. So that uh, I think doesn't bode well for corporate profits. And I don't think that um, enough uh, thought leaders are emphasizing this trend. Um, there's still there is a lot to focus on how difficult it is to find a job, but that is changing very quickly. Well, that's great. Um, so I guess I want to keep going on here and ask some other questions. Um, you know, I know part of the report, especially at the beginning, you talk about this baby boomer trend. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering for the audience if you wouldn't mind defining that. So what, what's the typical age of the baby boomer? And why is there so much news around it right now? Right. So the baby boomer, uh, those are right after the Second World War. There was a huge increase in fertility rates in the U.S. and other countries. Uh, and the typical definition of the baby boom period are all those people who were born between 1946 and, and the mid-60s. And as we can see here, this is uh, the largest uh, generation. It's much larger than the generation before it, the, the older generation, the silent age generation, and also larger than the generation afterward, after it. So as those people are uh, reaching the retirement years, we all of a sudden see a huge jump in the number of people retiring, uh, and that is uh, shrinking or uh, at least slowing down significantly the, the number of uh, working age uh, population. Yeah, so, um, it's the, it, you know, the slide really shows this, this huge dynamic where these, you know, the previous generation was smaller than the current one, and now, you know, like you said, all these upcoming generations are smaller too. Um, so the other part that I didn't quite understand in the report, so you talked about the baby boom generation, how it's impacting labor shortages. But what's going on with the overall working age population and how is that impacting uh, trends? Right. So we can see, uh, and I think that is um, one of the most uh, concerning trends, uh, we see in, in this chart, uh, we look at the age group of 18 to 64, which uh, we call the working age population, and we see how that uh, age group um, grows every year. And it typically used to grow by more than 1% every year, uh, even in some periods more than 1.5%. But now as the oldest baby boomers are reaching their retirement uh, ages, those, uh, this group is uh, growing much more slowly now growing at about 0.3%. And as we move uh, towards the next decade, it's almost going to be a zero growth for a long period of time through the end of the next decade. So we'll have um, about 15 years of almost no growth in the working age population or, or in labor supply, whereas at the same time, labor demand is likely to continue to grow by about 1% uh, every year on average. So the gap between labor demand and labor supply is going to uh, increase and uh, become very uh, significant as we move to, towards the end of this decade. So how does that play in then, Gad, with the, the unemployment rate? So in the U.S. right now, you know, we've had kind of a high unemployment rate. Um, will that how will that impact the declining working age population? I mean, you would think that there'd be some yeah. kind of bridge there. Well, one of the surprising things is that uh, the unemployment rate is not that high anymore. It's, uh, it used to be a 10% at the, after the recession at the end of 2009, but it dropped dramatically to uh, now it's actually 5.9%, uh, so less than 6%, a huge decline in the unemployment rate. Uh, partly as a result of the retirement of the baby boomers. So the, as they retire in large numbers, there's more opening for uh, job seekers. But also uh, this uh, unemployment rate is declining very rapidly because of uh, a, so a solid job growth. So despite overall disappointing economic growth in recent uh, years, job growth has been quite strong. Uh, for some reason, employers are unable to increase production without hiring more people. Uh, labor productivity, which used to grow at about 3% typically in the, in, during expansions in the past 20 years, in the last uh, 
four years has been growing at 0.7%, so almost no growth in labor productivity, which forces employers to hire uh, fast, and that's another reason why this unemployment rate is declining. Now, you see this gray line here, which uh, shows you the, the natural rate of unemployment, which is the rate uh, at which uh, it's kind of a theoretical threshold when the actual unemployment rate goes below the natural rate of unemployment, uh, we are likely to see a tight labor market and uh, wage pressures beginning to uh, appear. And we are just a few months away from that point. And then, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, 15 more years of almost no growth in labor supply, and um, the labor market is likely to continue gradually getting tighter. You know, in your, in your research, did you see any kind of specific trends amongst baby boomers? So did they have, you know, certain categories of jobs that are, that are you know, going to be in high need? Right. So, um, so that was, I think, that the main contribution of this report was to take those macro trends and try to uh, go beyond that and see in which uh, types of jobs, in which occupations, we are more likely to see... Um, shortages and so with, I won't go through all of the methodology that, that uh, we create that we use to create those indexes but basically looked at all kinds of uh, factors that could impact the labor shortages by specific occupations in the coming decade so things like how many people are likely to be added to the occupation how many people are likely to retire and would have to be replaced how many people are going to join uh, the occupation from schools or from unemployment and other factors. In total, 12 factors that we aggregated um, into um, an index. And what we see in this slide is a summary of, of the results of, those, of this index, where we have here um, numbers that are above one. Or, or for technical reasons, we made the average of all occupations equal zero. So the average value of our labor shortages index is zero. And we obviously we focused on occupations that are at a higher risk of uh, suffering from um, shortages. So most of the numbers that you see here are positive. So the higher the number, the higher the risk of shortages. Um, so, is it, so just to be clear for the audience, this is the index that you created specifically so you can measure what's going on with these different occupations, right? Right, yeah. So that's an aggregation of about 12 factors into uh, one index. Um, and the story here, that there, are, there are four main groups that I wanted to, to uh, concentrate on. Uh, one is the, uh, the top one in blue, the healthcare-related occupations. So those are occupations that uh, are ranked high because they are expected to grow very fast. Um, uh, the aging population in the U.S. and the Obamacare, which increases the number of people with health insurance, are both uh, significantly increasing the demand for health services and health occupations, both uh, very high uh, academically uh, occupations like doctors and, and specific nurses, as well as, uh, as, as uh, therapy assistants and aides. Uh, and uh, other types of uh, assistant and aids in the in the health uh, industry uh, are also likely to uh, suffer from shortages as they are uh, especially uh, likely to grow fast. But that was not a big surprise. Uh, what was surprising more for us is what we call uh, skilled labor occupations. So those are occupations that don't require a bachelor degree but do do require a significant. Uh, training and on-the-job training and uh, occupations like uh, various transportation and plant and system operators and electricians and that type of occupations, many of them are ranked high, not so much because they are expected to grow fast. They're actually expected to grow a at about average or even less in some of those occupations. The reason why we expect uh, big shortages in those occupations is that there are a lot of older workers who are about to retire and relatively few young people to replace them. So those types of jobs are not uh, the coolest or sexiest uh, according to the young generation. They don't view those occupations as, as their dream job, but they are in great demand and we're likely to see shortages in them. Um, 
the, if we go at the bottom, we see in gray uh, a bunch of other occupations that didn't fit into any other uh, group. Uh, what's interesting there are lawyers, for example, are not ranked uh, very high. Uh, they're ranked above average, but not particularly high. There are a lot of young people who want to become uh, lawyers. But I, I wanted to uh, emphasize a little more the, the green group here, uh, which are, are the STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math occupations. So some of them, uh, well, we included them as a specific group here, not because they are ranked very high, but actually because they are not ranked very high, which is, there is a big debate in recent years whether or not there are shortages in STEM. And in this study, which I think is the first one where STEM is compared to other occupations using similar metrics, STEM occupations on average don't uh, rank very high. Uh, mathematical occupations, um, they are a, an exception here, and that includes things like um, uh, operation research, actuaries, statisticians, some of the occupations that are related to the big data uh, revolution uh, are, are included there. But if you look at engineers or scientists or even computer occupations, on average, they are ranked uh, quite low. And uh, I can elaborate on that if you want, because that is one of the surprising results of our study. Yeah, you would expect that to be exactly the opposite, right? Um, could you could you could you talk a minute about the biological scientists and why? What does the negative index mean? So uh, biological uh, that means simply that they are ranked below average. So biological scientists are not. Um, Actually, let's go to the next slide, and I could uh, explain it more easily there. Um, well, so before here, we move, before we move on, I just have one entertaining question for. Uh, yeah. So, why religious leaders? Why why religious workers? Why is that index so high? <laughs> <laughs> um, the main reason uh, is that uh, they there are a lot of older workers in uh, that uh, group of occupations that are about to retire and a relatively few um, young people to replace them. That is uh, uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons for, for why they are ranked high. So that's so, so, so somewhat so similar. I guess, I guess if you want job security, you either need to go to be a religious worker or be, uh, be involved in water transportation, it seems. Or both. If you are willing to work as a religious worker on a ship, <laughs> then I think you're like, uh, you'll have the safest job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, so what we have here, it's a little complicated, but worth uh, spending a minute on because that uh, tells a good story. We have a, this scatter plot. We have two uh, on the horizontal axis. We have the projected employment growth uh, between 2012 and 2022. So uh, for example, uh, occupational therapy and physical therapists, that's all the way to, to, to the right uh, assistance and aid that uh, a group of occupation is expected to grow by more than 40%. Uh, so that's all the way to the right. And on the vertical axis, we have the projected replacement, which means how many people would retire and would have to be replaced minus expected new entrants. So an outlier here is if you look all the way up at plant and system operators, that's an occupation where there are a lot of people who are about to retire and very few people to replace them. So we see that the more you are to the right or the more you are towards the upper part of this uh, chart, you're more likely to have a higher rank. And the numbers within the bubbles are the, the value of the labor shortages index. So you'll see why some occupations are ranked high and, and some occupations are ranked low. Now, if we go to the biological scientist, so that is a, a minus 0 0.1. It's in this uh, purple. Uh, next to lawyers, a little above and to the left from lawyers, at co close to the left uh, bottom corner of the of the chart. So we see that this occupation is growing a, a little more slowly than average. Plus, there are a lot of young people compared to older people in this group. So um, this uh, this occupation, uh, even though it is. Um, a very high skilled uh, has a lot of people entering the occupation and uh, relatively few people retiring. 
And that's also a similar reason for why computer occupation, which is the lowest bubble here, is ranked also relatively low. It is growing uh, way faster than average, but uh, from all of the occupations in this chart, they have the smallest number of retirees compared to uh, new entrants. A lot of young people are entering computer occupations. Many of them, both in computers and in, among scientists, are immigrants, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that, uh, yeah. Can I just ask you a question? So a lot of the, a lot of our, a lot of people on this call. Um, you know, they have contact centers they operate, they have sales representatives, account managers. Can you right. talk about the outlook for those type of positions? Because they really are kind of common amongst a lot of companies. Right. Um, so if we look, for example, at sales representative, that's a very, that's at 0 0.2. So it's a little above average, very close to the middle of the, uh, of the pack here. Uh, so that's um, growing a little faster than average sale representatives uh, and have about the average in terms of older workers compared to new entrants. Uh, so I would say that they are likely to uh, suffer from shortages a little more than the average, but not uh, not much. Um, and, in, and again, this is ju most of the numbers that you see here are positive, meaning that they are above average and which those are the occupation we focused on. But half of the occupations, just to remind you, are negative. Uh, they are at a lower risk of shortages, and those are mostly the low-skilled occupations, like waiters and uh, all kinds of uh, low-skill low um, occupations that, uh, don't, that are easily... Uh, are easy to fill positions with, with even in if you, in case needed, the uh, high school uh, uh, students and such. So uh, in in those occupations, to have a real shortage is, is very unlikely because almost everyone can do those jobs. But the higher skilled workers, uh, it's uh, they are uh, ranked higher because we think it's not something that you can replace with a, a night notice. So let me ask you one quick question on the. I think you. So the, talk about the size of the bubbles. What does the size of the bubbles mean? Oh, the size of the bubbles are proportional to the size of the occupation, so how many people work there. So uh, um, the larger the bubble is, the more people work in that occupation. Great, thanks. And then I know you started talking about this a little earlier, but uh, you know we hear a lot about the shortages in the healthcare industry and, and the jobs requiring STEM skills. So are these are these claims exaggerated? Do you think? And you know what's driving the shortages? I know that leads into the next slide. I wonder if you could talk about those issues a little bit. Right. So you see uh, the, the the dotted line on the left is around eight percent. That's the average growth rate for all occupations. So we see that almost all all the bubbles here, which are all related to health occupations. They are all growing faster, almost all of them are growing faster than the average occupation. Some of them much, much uh, faster than, than average. Um, and uh, that's why uh, they are uh, ranked high, because uh, they're just going to grow so fast it will be hard to find uh, workers for all those occupations. Even uh, the ones that are not don't require a, a very high academic degree, but growing very fast, like uh, therapy assistance and aids or physician assistance. There is a trend now in health to uh, uh, move some of the responsibilities from doctors to uh, physician assistants and uh, various types of nurses, uh, and that uh, uh, resulting in much faster growth in those occupations than in doctors. Um, but uh, so, so we see uh, across the board very high um, uh, uh, value of the labor shortage in the index, uh, index. another uh, so the, one of the occupations that is ranked the highest are podiatrists which are high for two reasons one they are uh, expected to grow fast like other uh, health related occupations but among podiatrists for some reason there are a lot of uh, relatively a lot of older workers who are about to retire and a few uh, young people to replace them so that's increases the risk of labor shortages uh, even further. So the the good old foot doctor is a, yep. a yep. job. 
What about, um, you know, a lot of our clients are hospitals, and they have, you know, obviously a big need for nurses. Can you talk to that, uh, to that a little bit? I mean, we've been hearing from one of our clients that they just recently calculated, and it costs them $80,000 every time they have to replace a nurse. It's a really big, um, you know, cost to them. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing I'd throw in there is what is the peak? Like at what point, what year do we hit the peak of this, of this labor shortage? All right. So, so first about nurses, uh, you see here there's this big bubble in the middle uh, next to registered nurses. So uh, registered nurses are uh, well above average in terms of the uh, expected shortage. But if you go into, um, if you see to the right of it, you see nurse anesthetists and nurse practitioners and midwives that are ranked higher partly because they are growing uh, faster. So definitely uh, significant shortages in uh, in nurses um, uh, expected. Um, now when the peak will be, um, I think it, it, uh, we, we are still, uh, I think we are going to start seeing significant wage pressures in the next two years. But I think as we move forward, this gap between uh, uh, supply and demand is going to grow further and further. So probably in the next decade, that's when the peak will, will take place, uh, probably around 10 years from now. That's when I think uh, this trend will, will reach a peak. Uh, but starting in, in some occupations and locations, it's already starting. Uh, but as a, as a kind of a macro problem, uh, I think the peak will probably be a, bit, uh, a decade from now. So that's good. So, so you know, we still have time to plan for it then, I guess, is the key there. Yeah. Uh, can you talk ab about, um, so let's go back to STEM for a second. Are, um, mm -hmm. How is, is that, does it vary based on industry or is that is that pretty consistent, uh, you know, the STEM trends? Well, so w one of the surprising thing uh, or one of the re surprising reasons why STEM is not ranked that high is that, in, in this chart, we have a list of industries, and in blue, we highlighted the, what we call STEM-heavy industries, or industries that hire a lot of STEM workers. And you see that uh, some of them are, uh, they, they are ranked according to the employment uh, uh, column here, that, which is the annual rate of change between 2012 and 2022 in the employment in each of those industries. So we see a lot of those blue STEM-heavy industries uh, ranked quite low and even um, have expected negative employment growth. And that's not because they are expected uh, to, to die as industries, they're the opposite. If we look, for example, at telecommunications, which is the fifth row from the bottom, we see that in the middle column output, they are expected to grow by 3.4% every year. So that's a pretty uh, faster than the overall economy. But... Uh, they are expecting a, a very, that's the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which came out with those numbers. They're expecting productivity, which is the column on the right, to grow by 4% every year. So that means that this 3.4 increase in output could be achieved with a shrinking uh, employment. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, for example, computer programmers today can do much more than they could have done a, a decade ago. Uh, and that's likely to continue in the future. So those STEM occupations have um, much faster productivity growth than the rest of the economy. And as a result, uh, employment in many of those occupations is not increasing very rapidly or, or more slowly than many would uh, think. Um, but I think perhaps the most important reason why STEM workers are not uh, in a great risk of shortage compared to other occupation is the fact that there are a lot of young people and especially immigrants entering those occupations in the US. So what we have in this uh, slide is the percent of immigrants uh, for uh, specific occupations. And by immigrants, I mean people who are either not citizens or people who uh, got their citizenship uh, or were naturalized. Um, and we see that in some STEM occupations like medical scientists, 43% of all the workforce in the US are immigrants. And in many other STEM occupations, it's in the 20s or 30s. Whereas uh, in many other occupations, if you look at the right hand side, there are almost no immigrants for various reasons. So immigration uh, is a solution or, or uh, 
already solved part of the shortages problem among uh, among um, STEM occupation, and that's likely to continue to be the case uh, moving forward. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why STEM did not rank as high in our rankings. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, could you also talk about, you know, are these trends happening the same in every state, or do they differ amongst the states? I know we have clients on the call across the U.S., and I'm sure they're interested in hearing about how their geography plays into this. Right. So we're now working on, on making or creating uh, labor shortages uh, risk indexes for specific states. We're not there yet, but one thing that we can tell is, is from looking at a, a chart like this, this is a chart that looks at um, the unemployment rate in, in the spring of 2014 versus um, the average unemployment rate in, 20, in 2005 and 2006, which were kind of normal years in terms of unemployment. And we see that um, whereas in, in states that suffered from a big housing crisis like California, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, in those states the unemployment rate is still well above normal. Uh, but if you look at the resource-rich heartland from North Dakota to Texas, uh, uh, areas that have a lot of oil and gas extraction and other commodities and agricultural goods, um, they are enjoying the boom in commodity prices in recent years. And uh, as a result, they are already at normal unemployment rate. And in some cases, like North Dakota, uh, unemployment rates are well below normal already. Yeah, that's what, that's what jumps out to me, right? The middle states you see, they have the highest decreasing in unemployment, and then you have, right. and then you have the the coast, the you know the opposite side, no pun intended, relative <laughs> to the relative to the middle country, you don't see that happening. So what's happening on the coast? They're just not benefiting from the. From so the, the coast. Uh, on the west coast, especially California and, and Arizona, Nevada, they had it terrible housing crisis, so they, their economy has just plummeted during the recession or still uh, recovering. In the same case is for Florida and Georgia, for example, whereas the states in the middle of the country, they, they are uh, very into mining uh, and uh, oil and gas extraction, and uh, that is um, speeding uh, economic recovery in those states, so they are basically back to normal. So uh, in terms of labor shortages, they are probably you're going to start feeling them faster in those heartland states uh, and much later in the states that suffered from the housing crisis. So, um, so I know we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of global issues, but I thought it would. I noticed one part that was very interesting to me on, uh, in the research was, you know, how this trend is applying across impacting the entire you know, world. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what the differences are between the different mature economies and how they're being impacted? Right. So in, in this chart, we see the, the annual growth in working age population in, in uh, four groups of countries. And, you know, so far I talked mostly about the U.S., and we see that in the U.S. it's actually in better shape than other advanced economies. And you can see at the bottom the list of um, uh, countries in each group, but in a mature Europe and mature Asia Pacific, we see already that in the past two years, uh, the working age population already started to decline, and a lot of it is because of uh, Germany and Japan, big countries with um, fast shrinking uh, working age population. So, um, so in, in some sense, uh, those countries are more likely. Uh, to suffer, uh, some of those countries are more likely to suffer from shortages in the in the longer run. And in, in particular, if we go to to the next slide, uh, one of the exercises we, we we try to estimate at what year the unemployment rate will reach the natural rate of unemployment, which we uh, talked about before for the U.S. Uh, or in other words, in, in what, uh, when are sh labor shortages going to become an issue in, in each country? And we see that in some countries like Canada, Germany, Japan, it already happened. In countries like the U.S. and the U.K., uh, it's likely to happen in 2015. But then there is a bunch of other countries, almost all of them European, where it's more uh, will take a few years to get to, and 
in countries like Greece, uh, Italy, Portugal, Spain, I, I think it will not happen at all in this decade. So there's a large variation in uh, when labor shortages will become an issue in different countries. How do you think that will impact the business in the U.S.? These, you know, the labor shortages in other countries and when they hit the natural rate of unemployment. Right, so I think uh, we generally see uh, um, higher uh, wage growth. We will see uh, a lot of costs related uh, uh, to replacing workers uh, because uh, retention rates are likely to drop when there are more opportunities in other companies. Uh, so uh, I think that this is much more than just an HR problem of, of difficulty uh, of filling positions that could easily become a problem that will impact the bottom line of companies. And this is not just a theoretical problem. Um, this actually happened in the late 1990s, as we can see in the, the next slide. Um, what we have here, uh, if, if you look at the, the left part of this, you see the gross value added of the non-financial corporate business. Uh, gross value added is something quite similar to revenues. So we can just treat it as, as a revenues. So if you look at the period of the late 1990s, early 2000, you see that uh, revenues were growing strong, which is not a surprise. That was the high-tech revolution. Uh, and uh, we saw very strong revenue growth. But surprisingly, during that period, we saw the blue line is the corporate profits of that sector, and it actually declined. So from 97 to 2000, even though revenues were growing strong, corporate profits declined by 22%, which is very unusual to have declining profits in a period of strong revenue growth. But one explanation for it is, is in the part on the right. So what else happened during those years? We had one of the tightest labor markets ever in the U.S. economy. Uh, and the unemployment rate reached 4 point, uh, or below 4.8%. Uh, um, and as a result, uh, we see here uh, that compensation was growing faster than revenue. So the gray line on the right-hand side is the same as the gray line on the left side, but it reflected in uh, growth rates rather than levels. And the blue line on the right is the growth rate of compensation. Now, usually, Reven revenues are growing faster than compensation, uh, but in the late 1990s, compensation, because of the tight labor market, was growing faster than revenues. And since compensation is the dominant cost in most companies, that immediately led to a decline in uh, corporate profits. So again, I think uh, in the next several years, we're likely to reach another period of um, tight labor market and that uh, could uh, easily uh, impact the bottom line of many companies. So potentially good for the employee, but, but a struggle for the employer. Yeah, uh, no, the, the, I'm uh, talking from the point of view of employers here, but certainly if we talk about it from the point of view of employees, the lower unemployment rates are uh, good news. Uh, you're less likely to be unemployed. If you are unemployed, you're more likely to find a job quickly and your wages are, are likely to climb faster. So that's good news for employees and not so good news for employers. So wow, this is, you know, this is quite um, enlightening. I guess, I guess a lot of people are probably thinking themselves, I am. So what, what do we do about this? What are the, what are the implications and what can we do about it? Right. I thought, I thought it'd be helpful for you to talk kind of on a macro level of what we, you know, what your findings were for implications to businesses. And then I thought um, we could then talk a little bit more in detail about kind of steps that companies could take to deal with these upcoming changes. Okay. Um, so I think the first implication is that uh, almost by definition, uh, when unemployment rates go uh, down, it is harder to find qualified workers. That's the essence of a labor shortage. And at the same time, since the main driver here uh, is the retirement of the baby boomer, I think another implication is there will be a lot of uh, lost knowledge due to retirement, which I think for some countries is even a bigger uh, concern than uh, shortages. Uh, I think another implication, as I mentioned before, will see lower retention rates as there are more opportunities out there. We, we already see uh, 
um, a decline in retention rates, and that's likely to continue. And the combination of this uh, war for talent is likely to uh, cause a faster compensation growth, uh, which, I, as I mentioned before, is likely to squeeze um, corporate profits. So I think uh, when that happens, the senior management is going to start uh, screaming <laughs> and try to um, uh, regain uh, the, the, the lost uh, profit. So there will be an intense pressure to increase uh, hours worked and productivity from existing workers when it's becoming hard to fill um, or to replace uh, existing workers. Um, I think uh, recruitment intensity is likely to increase uh, partly by uh, tapping uh, types of population that were not tapped before for various uh, types of jobs. Uh, so, for example, as, as I showed before, there are, um, for some reasons, there are very few immigrants in various occupations, or maybe when uh, significant shortages are coming, uh, recruiters will go to, to um, untapped populations for various types of jobs. Uh, we'll probably see... Um, as especially as um, positions and, and jobs are getting more specialized and uh, require more institutional knowledge, uh, we will see more uh, training and internal worker mobility uh, within companies and uh, uh, to kind of fill uh, occupation or jobs that are in uh, significant shortages. Uh, Another way to, to, re, to reduce the shortage problem, especially in occupations where there is a lot of retirement, is uh, to keep the older workers uh, on for longer. So if uh, in, in normal times employers give uh, older workers incentive to, to retire early, and maybe now they'll change the incentive structure to, to keep them uh, on for, for longer, uh, in, in, in especially in, in certain occupations. Um, we may see a, a movement or another wave of uh, offshoring if it's uh, harder to find uh, workers in the U.S. Uh, so one solution is to uh, offshore the jobs to other countries, but that's a solution only for some occupations. Uh, the majority of occupations are not offshoreable, uh, so, but for the ones that are, uh, offshoring could be a solution. But I think eventually cost will rise and, and uh, businesses will have to pass some of the cost to the consumers <coughs> and, and that will result in, in a little higher inflation rate. And in the most extreme situations, um, some operations that used to be profitable uh, when labor cost was low uh, may not be profitable anymore and as a result uh, production will be lower. So that, I think, uh, is kind of the ultimate constraint of the uh, low labor supply growth is that uh, it will increase uh, economic growth. And that could be a solution if, there, if the government and companies don't wake up in time and, and try to do something about that. So from the government perspective, I think uh, faster immigration growth and better alignment of the educational system with the occupations that are in shortages. That those are the main things the government can do to help this uh, situation. So thanks, Gad. So I thought I thought what we do is dig a little deeper into four of these. So <coughs> if you, if you look at if you look at number uh, number one and number eight, those are really focused on focus on this whole qualified worker, the need to be focused on that. And then two and nine are, are more focused on the baby boomer generation retiring. So I thought we'd like dig into those in a little bit more detail. So, so there are several issues we can be thinking about um, in developing plans regarding the baby boomer retirement. I'm going to focus on those first. So due to the cha challenges of an aging workforce, employers are going to have to, as you indicated, Gad, introduce new roles for older workers and potentially new compensation reward policies for baby boomers. I know you indicated you know, maybe, I know you indicated, um, you know, maybe changing incentive plans. Um, so we pulled our, we pulled some data from our clients, and we definitely see a trend that more and more older workers are taking advantage of the tuition assistance spend. And we term, we determined this by looking at average tenure of employees using the program, and that, that has gone up just over the last three years from 6.6 .6 years to 7.4 years. So you are seeing an increased usage of tuition assistance. So what are mm -hmm. our recommendations? Our recommendations is to develop a process to document 
all of the knowledge that the aging generation has accumulated in your company, develop a mentor program to assist with the knowledge or skill transfer, and think about how you could change your policies to retain the baby boomer generation for just an extra couple of years. You know, do you have a job sharing program where retirees could share a job with each other? Do you do you allow um, we, we, would you allow retirees potentially to to work part time so they can slowly enter into re, enter into retirement? So I guess the question is, how can you adjust tuition assistance policy to support this? Um, how can you, as employers, encourage these employees to continue learning even though the company may not benefit from this investment? In other, in other words, you might start thinking about tuition assistance for older employees as a professional development and retention tool and not as a strategic investment as they do for younger workers. Um, they all, you know, we know the retirees all benefit from the, they're all going to qualify for the program, so really it's a question of changing the way it is marketed internally. So for example, maybe maybe allow them to take courses related to their passions to help them prepare for retirement. The goal would be to keep them for those extra couple of years providing time for knowledge transfers and filling, and filling roles. So if we move on, let's talk about the qualified workers and the training and mobility. So what can we do about finding qualified workers? So a couple recommendations. So if you take a look at GAD's index um, that his team has built and look at which roles in your organization have a high index and focus on those positions. Maybe you have a different plan for each one of those key roles. Um, do you have a plan for identifying those roles that will be hard to fill and develop internal talent to fill them? We also think educating the senior management about these upcoming skill shortages as they pertain to your organization is going to be real key um, you know, in being able to plan for it. And think about, you know, think about ways suitable for your company culture that will encourage people to move towards those roles, those key roles. For example, if your organization employs physical therapists or mathematical scientists, which we identify as key groups, you might want to you know, publicize the need for those jo jobs internally, um, develop internal programs, internal training programs to help them along. So now let's shift real quickly to talking more specifically about tuition assistance, and then, we'll, then Gad and I are going to answer any questions you may have. So when we think about tuition assistance, we think this can play a real critical role in, in, in these upcoming trends. Um, it's a great opportunity to showcase the, t the strategic value of tuition assistance programs um, in this case. So here are some specific examples. So offer a higher cap for degrees needed for skill shortage areas. So if you, have, if you identify that one of these jobs in GADS index is a, uh, a needed job, maybe you offer them a higher cap than you would normally in your tuition assistance program. If you partner with that assist or some other um, similar company, you know we have advisors who help who help employers make decisions about what programs to go uh, to attend or what degree to get, and these advisors can help kind of push employees to these these needed scare, skill areas. Uh, if you have internal career development counselors, they should do the same thing. And then finally, make sure your administration system can run reports showing employees who graduate in the next six to 12 months with these in-demand skills. Um, I think it's also important to recognize there's a time lag for degrees. It takes several years for working adults to graduate. So you need to act now and you need to stay ahead of the curve to be able to fulfill the needs of your business uh, on a go going forward basis. Certifications can help with this. You know, remember certifications, they're cheaper than degrees, they are, they're cheaper than degrees, and they, you can get them in a quicker period of time than, than degree programs. So think about including certifications in your tuition assistance program. And make sure a conversation is taking place with those employees who are about to graduate with a degree in, the, in, the, in these in-demand jobs. You know, celebrate them as they graduate. Make sure you have an opening for them since they are such uh, high in demand. And I would also say educational partnerships can help with this. Partners, partner with schools who can deliver the in-demand skills they need and reward them by sending the more employees their way. Think about um, cohort programs or customized learning of some kind. And then finally, we would recommend measuring the impact of your efforts. Measure employees completing internal training and education programs in skilled shortage areas. Measure their retention for the future. Think about it, it'd be a great story to tell in the future if you were able to say in 2014 we identified these areas as future skill gaps at our company and here are the steps we took 
and here we're, we're staying ahead of the curve. We're able to deliver and maintain our business performance because we got ahead of the curve. So with that, um, we'd like to open up to any questions that you may have. So here's one question, um, Gad, that we've got. Uh, given a tighter labor market, will companies be, a, be more compelled to modify operations with technological in, in, uh, innovations? I think we talked a little bit about this, designed to eliminate some traditional job functions. I know, I know we've been hearing about that in the news lately. The biggest one that I heard is McDonald's now is going to have a self-service for ordering your food over the counter rather than talking to a cashier. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, having equipment replace workers, that's something that's been always a, a trend. And I would say with the kind of new computer uh, internet uh, developments of uh, the previous uh, in the, in the last generation, I think a lot of the low-hanging fruit of, uh, in terms of replacing workers with equipment already took place, especially, I would say, between 1995 and uh, 2005. I think uh, what we see now, um, especially in the past four years, is a, a significant slowdown in that. So to, to replace the next worker is uh, becoming more, more, more and more difficult. Um, I think companies are trying to do this all the time, and probably when uh, labor shortages will hit them, uh, they will try even harder. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the technology, uh, it seems like the trend of the technology replacing uh, workers is, is slowing down. Uh, it's still, I would say, a very open question. There's a lot of debate around it in economics, but every quarter that we get a low growth in labor productivity, you know, suggests that this may be a new trend, uh, that uh, slow productivity growth. Mm -hmm. So when the, the other question we've got here, Gad, is um, when, will the conference board be updating this research and, and your index on a regular basis? Right. So the, the, the core of, um, we, we'll probably update it annually. Uh, some of the data, especially the projections by the government of a uh, uh, employment growth and replacement rates by um, occupation is available, is updated only uh, once every two years. The next up time it will be updated is about a year from now. So um, we, we, we are planning, there was a, it resonated very well with our audience and I think there is great demand for that. So we are probably going to uh, keep updating it. Um. So I think we have one more question here, but I would encourage you to submit uh, questions in the Q&A box if you have any. But the, the last one that we have is um, that I, so they're, I think what they're asking is, you know, we talked a lot about healthcare, the healthcare industry and the impact these trends will have on them. Are there other major industries that will be impacted even more strongly? Um, I think some of the, so the the utility industry, for example, uh, where a lot of those uh, skilled uh, skilled labor occupations that we mentioned uh, are likely are, are very much represented in those uh, in in the utilities industry. That's another industry that uh, I, that is in um, danger. I would say some of the transportation industries are uh, in danger as well. There are um, a lot of uh, occupations that are uh, likely to be in shortage there. I, I would say also some of the consulting, especially technological uh, uh, consulting companies uh, are likely to uh, suffer from uh, shortages uh, just because they have a very high skilled uh, labor force. Um, things related to mining and extractions uh, and industries related to that uh, are also in danger. Um, those are some of the the main ones, but certainly health related industries, I would put them at the top. Well, thank you, Gad. That was uh, certainly very interesting to hear, you know, the research from the conference board on this and hearing your perspective. So thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time and thank you for all the participants and your great questions. Um, you know, we will be sending you a PDF of the slides and recording like we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, in the meantime, we hope those on the phone think about joining us uh, live 
in April for our annual Solutions at Work event. Um, it's going to be happening this time in Pasadena, California, a nice warm climate. So we hope you join us then. Again, Gad, thank you very much. Thank you to the co conference board. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, Ed Assist or Bright Horizons, you can look, up, uh, look us up on our website, edassist.com or brighthorizons.com. And again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day.